This Stephen Curry three-point attempt after Austin Rivers' forearm smacked him in the head was initially called a foul. Minnesota would challenge the call and one camera angle would prove that Steph clearly got hit, but crew chief Sean Wright would give this reasoning for why that wasn't the case. Ball was count. Because the ball was not touching the Minnesota ball on the baseline. What? The Minnesota challenge is successful because the ball was not touched. It's the second time in this very young NBA season that the review system has failed Steph, who also had a foul against him on a three-pointer overturned in Miami last month. Jordan McLaughlin's replacement in Austin Rivers also ran over Steph on this play, but the refs were silent. We're going to look at how Curry and the Dubs took that disrespect from the officials personally and used it to become closer as a collective unit. Draymond Green's been more productive than former Raptor Finals MVP Kawhi Leonard's been in 2022-23 so far, yet the Warriors enforcer continues to receive a lack of recognition for his play. So we'll talk about that and also much more, considering the Warriors starting five ranks number one among all 30 teams in offensive rating, net rating, and effective field goal percentage. Trust me, you're going to want to stay tuned, but right quick, just 9.4% of you watching are subscribed, so subscribe if you haven't already, leave a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm, and make sure you're fully up to date with my content by following at Hoops on Instagram and Twitter. Steph Curry shooting 66% in the painted area, which is better than the most reputable slasher in Giannis. Curry shooting 55% from the mid-range, which is better than the most reputable in-between guy in DeRozan. Steph's 63% efficiency on two-point shots is better than a top old-school low-post center in Avica Zubats. Last but not least, his 56% clip in ISOs is better than one of the greatest one-on-one -on -one scorers of all time in Kevin Durant. Curry also owns the highest plus-minus of any player this season, all of that, and he's still getting shortchanged by the officials. Aside from the play heavily broken down in the intro, where the ref said that the ball wasn't touched so it wasn't a foul, on this wild Austin Rivers closeout, which knocks Steph over, I get it's not always a foul when a player falls over, and a lot of the times players just fall over intentionally to try to get a whistle blown, but considering how Rivers undercuts Curry, paired with the fact that there's such a point of emphasis on protecting a shooter's landing space, I was absolutely shocked when not one of the three refs blew the whistle. And it's not just because Steph's a superstar and that I think he deserves superstar calls, it's that literally every other time I've seen a collision like that around the perimeter, I've seen said player who got hit go to the foul line. This is getting blatantly stupid. More stupidity occurred when Draymond Green was whistled for a technical foul for celebrating. Later on, Curry exaggerated a celebration and intentionally picked up a tech in support of Green. It was great to see the two future first ballot Hall of Famers share a good moment on the pine, but it's a shame these guys are getting treated as they have been by the NBA Refing Association. More on Draymond in a minute, but this review system is completely broken. For this next point, I'm not even referencing the Sunday debacle in Minneapolis, but on most of these decisions I've seen being made around the league, after the refs go to the monitor, it almost seems like the call just goes to the home team. Firstly, whoever these refs are talking to on the headsets is the person who needs to be making the decision, and right now, it seems to be the refs that have a say on what the call is, when it should be coming from an unbiased source that can quickly look at every angle of the play. Maybe putting that take in question, whoever's contributing to the decision making and speaking to these refs in Secaucus evidently has no clue in hell of what they're doing. Former DPOY Draymond Green is having a shockingly phenomenal offensive season, which was just displayed in his season-best 19-point outing against Minnesota. Green also posted 11 dimes and 2 blocks in that game, but more notably, over the young 19-game season as a whole, Green's currently making a career second-best 36.4% of his three-pointers. His highest clip from distance came back in 2015-16, where he made 38.8% of his triples, comparing Dre's numbers to the all -beat it very banged up Kawhi Leonard this year, and Green's true shooting percentage plus assist and rebounding numbers are far above the claws. Also, Green's only 1.2 points behind averaging the same amount of points than Leonard. Kawhi's rightfully known as an all-time great forward, but this just proves to you that we should stop calling Draymond a triple single liability. Personally, I've never called him that, but there's been times where I haven't been the most respectful to Dre's value. 
Purely in terms of Green's passing chops, not only does he have a telepathic playmaking connection with Curry, but he's one of the best playmaking bigs across the association in general. Just ahead of Giannis, Draymond currently leads all power forwards in assists per game. Whether it's DHOs, finding guys on backdoor cuts, or out of split actions or hammer actions, Draymond's facilitating is a disrespectfully underrated asset to the Warriors' offensive flow. Maybe the best threading of the needle all season from Draymond came when he didn't even get credited for an assist. Out of this stagger split action, instead of using the Javante Green pick, Clay decides to cut back door, and despite three defenders being in his vicinity, Thompson's been playing with Green way too long to not know how good of a passer he is, and Green steps forward to get momentum for a flashy yet fundamental bounce pass through Powell, Morris, and Zubats, and Thompson gets fouled. On the topic of Clay, I broke down more on him last video, but it's worth noting that that half number two of the Splash Brothers in KT has made a blistering 28 of his last 53 point shots for an outstanding 56% clip. Thesaurus Clay himself had his take on his performance post game. We're so great in transition, and that flow really benefits us, I think, the most. So the not fouling and the ball movement were really the two components that propelled us to this victory, I think. Man, she's some great words. Who was the Warriors MVP in the game against Minnesota? Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out in the top five commenters by December 21st. Earn free merchandise of their choosing. Today's speaks winner is Nate S.A. The Legend, who says, I believe the Warriors are turning the corner, but to completely turn the season around, two things must happen. First, they have to start playing better than 500 on the road. They'll likely be on the road more often during the playoffs at this point, so establishing a good road record moving forward is critical. Second, their bench needs to solidify. It's good to see Draymond mixing in to the bench squad to direct and teach them in game how to communicate and run plays but when the core isn't on the court they're a liability to the team the bench is only a season or two from becoming the starting team steph's remaining career length may rely entirely on how much rest he can get moving forward versus how much weight he must continue to shoulder pool kaminga wiseman must find their way before the team can truly be said to have turned the corner thanks to nate for the great take thanks for watching have a good one